Yes, and actually you, you pointed already to some of the, of the things that I thought it would be interesting to discuss together because uh, it seems that almost all of you in some way or other um, pointed to this uh, lack of cooperation in one way or the other. Um, because I was going to ask you first what you see as the greatest challenges in cross-border mobility, but to me it actually seems from what you've said already, you kind of answered that question that many of you have, have pointed to a lack of cooperation in one way or the other. And, um, and of course the question is, is this a lack of political cooperation? I mean, what we see today is cooperation of researchers. So at least it seems that on the, on the research level, there at least is some cooperation that does exist and works well, as you said, Finland should take examples from Öresund when we talk about tunnels and, and all of this. So I think in the, on the research level, we have quite a lot of interaction between researchers from different countries sharing experiences and research results. But how about this lack of political cooperation that several of you have, have pointed towards? Um, what do you think, where does it stem from? Why is there such a lack of political cooperation? Um, are these the these administrative obstacles that you just described? Or is it a lack of political will? Or, or where do you see the actual reasons for, for a lack of cooperation on the political level? And, and what do you see? How, how could we overcome this? Or what would we need to do in order to, to change that? Is it, are you asking me? Uh, I'm asking the whole think, panel. Uh, so this is now a question okay. to the whole panel. So each of you who wants to go first can go first and can raise your hand or indicate that you want to say something. Yeah, please go ahead, Lofa. Yeah, okay. I will say that politicians uh, who are national politicians are thinking in a national context. And the administrative systems are doing the same thing. And it's very, very difficult to think across borders for those systems. And uh, the knowledge uh, on other countries are almost not existing. I think, in general, Danes don't know Sweden. And Swedes don't know Denmark. Um, they don't know the Danish history. They don't know the culture. They don't know the cultural differences. They believe we are much more equal than we are. Uh, it doesn't mean that there uh, is a real differences which makes it unimpossible to cooperate, but we have to uh, understand it. And this could be a conclusion for one of your other questions. There needs to be made research on the differences between the different Nordic countries and the Baltic countries, so we can get a better understanding of each other. Thank you. How about the other panelists? I yes. Yeah, uh, a few words. I, I think uh, <coughs> there is a, as was mentioned earlier, there there is a lack of knowledge, uh, and I think there is also a tendency to to look at number of individuals rather than the potential of of cross-border uh, integration. I can take a concrete example. Um, let's say that you live in Sweden and work in Denmark. Then you are to pay your taxes in, in Denmark. During the COVID-19 crisis, we have been forced to, to work from our homes. So even though you, you have your uh, employer in Denmark, you work from your home in, in Sweden. If you do that for more than three months, which has been the case during the COVID-19 crisis, Suddenly, you have to pay taxes in Sweden, because the limit is only three months. And this concerns, I would say, roughly 20,000 people at the moment. So a letter has been uh, written to uh, the ministers for finance in the Nordic countries to, to point out the fact that this is, this is a problem. And this is a problem due to the fact that people have been forced by political decisions to work from their homes. It's not their choice. So please, could this be corrected, um, seeing COVID-19 as a force, uh, force majeure? The answer was no. Since it only affects a small number of people, uh, it's not worthwhile to do these changes, to, to have these uh, exemptions. And again, this to me shows that our politicians tend to look at the numbers or the number of people involved. And yes, they are quite small. But if you look at, at the potential, especially the future potential uh, that you lose by raising these obstacles and not addressing the problems uh, caused by COVID-19, then I think you would have a greater sense of urgency at the political level. 
But as long as they count heads rather than uh, economic potential in the long term, this is where we will remain. Thank you. Rolle, you had to comment as well. Yeah, I can say a few words. Thanks. Uh, if I look at my own research, that is quite much has been based on, on labor markets and, and different labor market actors. Um, well, they, if you talk about the migration from Estonia to Finland, work by based migration, the labor market actors uh, in Finland and in all other countries are, of course, very much based on a, based on a, on a national framework. The trade unions, even if they have international cooperation, their framework and power resources are very much uh, based or embedded in the nation state. Um, and in terms of trade union cooperation between Estonia and, and Finland is 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 different is difficult because in Estonia, uh, let's say in the construction sector, there is basically no trade union to cooperate with. The trade union have very, very few members in Estonia. Um, and in terms of these practical issues, of course, this type of transnational connections or transnational cooperation, it, it's always a question of resources, time, uh, people who, who are civil servants or work in a trade union or whatever organization, they are busy. Uh, and the question is, why would I do extra work sometimes, uh, which is very sometimes need, needs very new thinking and, and new t types of, of uh, initiatives and approaches. So I think this is one, one, one question. And then I've also been looking a little bit at, at these labor inspectorates between in Finland and Estonia. I mean, there is a problem in terms of labor rights. People who are posted from Estonia to Finland to work in the construction sector don't always get paid what they should be paid. Uh, and the national actors are they, are they are very much slower than the companies. Uh, companies can work on a very quick base, send, send workers, and they can keep keep co uh, contact over the borders very quickly and effectively. The national um, civil servants are always a few few steps after. So I think it's a question of resources and and time and and maybe sometimes lack of viable new ideas. Thank you very much. Um, before we, oh, sorry, yes, go ahead, please. <laughs> Ole. Yes, uh, I could also uh, add a add few words. I totally agree with, with Jonas, and I also mentioned earlier that actually lack of knowledge of, of these uh, transnational people is, is also one reason why, why uh, politicians don't consider them. Or, or as, as mentioned, that uh, official statistics may say that these, uh, the number of, of these people are very, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> are, are so, uh, too few, but actually they, in de facto, they could be much more, but they are doing very uh, short-term uh, work to another country or they're outsourced uh, to a very short period of time. And in that sense, we actually, from official uh, statistics and data sources, we actually don't know the the, the actual uh, numbers of, of people that are <clears throat> potentially affected when when COVID restrictions are perhaps uh, uh, put in force. So in that okay, sense, so uh, in that sense, uh, research is uh, very important for for that. I think the role of research like seems to pop up again and again, and the lack of lack of knowledge. And I think it was actually actually shocking to hear when. Uh, when uh, Ulfa said that, that Swedes don't know about the Danish system, the Danes don't know about the Swedish system, you would think that neighbouring countries with such strong interaction that this knowledge would be there and it would travel between these countries and, and I think there's a lot to be done. Maybe be quick, before we quickly give the audience a chance to ask questions if they have any, um, because we, this panel is about new challenges and I think now that we talked about COVID, this is a rather new situation, um, but what would you say I mean, there will be a time when, when after COVID, how do you how do you see um, the future basically? So, so what what do you think? What forms of cross border mobility will this region take, and in what direction will it change? And what will be the, the greatest challenges that you see for the future? We, we quite a lot talked about the present now, and maybe to look ahead a little. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, go ahead. 
just a brief brief comment that uh, I think the main challenge is, as Jussi very nicely pointed out, that uh, lack of of seeing the the long term strategy or 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 actually also uh, putting that in the first place and not only looking for a short term um, uh, actions that are going on. So I think that's the one of the main reasons we can't or that is. Uh, a bit hindering the, the cooperation. Yeah, and I think that's very true for all discussions around questions of cross-border mobility and migration. They tend to be very short-term in, in the present and, and not looking at the, the broad perspective, both historically and for the future. So I think this is a very important point. Um, yes, Uffe, you had a comment. Yeah, just one thing. I agree 100%, and uh, I think that's the main conclusion from the Russian experience. That's a lack of a real strategy for creating an Eurasian region. There was only a strategy for construction. Yeah, and that is a really good point. You build a bridge and you think about the construction and not about all the social, economic and logistic um, effects this will actually have when, when you do something like that. That is a really good point to keep in mind. Yes, any other thoughts on our on, on future challenges from the panel? If not, I would also give other people the chance to ask questions. I also have more, but, but if we have uh, the audience or other participants who want to ask you something, maybe I could give the floor to them. Uh, <clears throat> I don't uh, see questions from the audience at the moment. I have one uh, a slightly provocative question to uh, basically all panelists. Initially, I had a plan to ask this from Jonas during his presentation, but we had certain time limits. Um, I thought that Baltic countries have this problem that we do not know much about our neighbours here in the Baltics, but uh, now I hear that uh, in the Nordic countries you have uh, similar issues. Despite of that, I have a question, uh, at least uh, at the political level, Nordic countries have formed a rather exceptional club, uh, integrated historically, culturally, economically, is there any chance that by 2030 or at least 2050 the Nordic club will have more members compared with what you have today? I know at least one country who is trying to knock to the door sometimes. Or there is another scenario, of course, that uh, there will be in the future two exceptional clubs, Baltic and Nordic club, and we have very close cooperation and integrated markets. What are your comments on that? Well, should, should I uh, start? Yes, go ahead, please, Jonas. Yes. I think uh, throughout history, uh, our view of regional cooperation has, uh, has shifted. I remember in the mid-90s when, when Sweden and, and Finland joined, uh, joined the EU, uh, regional cooperation was seen as something, uh, well, something of lesser importance, of lesser importance. We, were supposed, we were supposed to be uh, good Europeans and should not only concern ourselves with our small part of, of the world and I think also globalization has uh, tended during some times to say that the Nordic perspective is is a very limited one and we should have a more worldly out view but uh, the last couple of years uh, for several reasons, we have seen a uh, renaissance for regional cooperation, not only in, in, in the Nordic countries, but we have seen it throughout uh, Europe and, and the world. So in that sense, I think that the focus on, on, on working with your immediate neighborhood, trying to create a strong regional block in a very uh, uncertain or in very uncertain times, that tendency will be uh, reinforced. Um, from, from there, where do we go? Uh, do we have cooperation between regions or do we try to expand our own region to include other countries? Um, I have no clear answer there. I think uh, within uh, the Nordic family at the moment, there are different voices. 
there are those who see clear benefits of a, a, uh, a an even deeper Nordic Baltic cooperation, but there are also those who see uh, that uh, the Nordic countries have uh, special features uh, that are best promoted or safeguarded by sticking together uh, only in a Nordic uh, context. So I think that for the foreseeable future, um, the Nordic Council of Ministers, for example, will not be expanded with more members. But I think that in areas where we see uh, practical benefits of working together with uh, the Baltic countries, uh, for example, in areas such as digitalization, there we will see uh, project-based uh, cooperation. But it will not be politically uh, founded in a in a joint, uh, let's say, political body. That's my best guess. Thank you. How about the other panelists? Do you have a, a reply to the answer of the Nordic club and with, whether it will be larger in the future? No? Yes, then maybe before we have a few more few more minutes. Um, one thing that comes up regularly, of course, that we talked about now is, is the role of research and that we need more research and more knowledge. Um, but how, how do you think can we enhance that research knowledge, which there is a lot of research done, how does this knowledge actually then reach the decision makers and the people who will then be able to make decisions on enhanced cooperation and on taking a more long-term perspective? Because it's one thing if we as researchers uh, or if at conferences we, we discuss this and say this, but then to actually make this happen um, on, on the more decision-making level, where do you see how can how can that be improved? And what's the role of, of, of research basically here? Yes, go ahead, Uther. Uh, yeah, I will say that uh, when uh, we are discussing the knowledge on the different countries, as we did before, and there was also a question on it, uh, and I said uh, the knowledge is not that big, if I may say it in that way. The, the main problem is that there is a, an idea of that the countries are more alike than they are. It doesn't mean that they, in a global perspective, are not alike. But for example, when you're taking the administrative systems, they are different. The way you have uh, treated the COVID crisis in, for example, Denmark and Sweden, is reflecting the different administrative traditions and also systems. It's not, it's not uh, out of the, the air that the civil servants in Sweden and the experts, uh, the experts has uh, decided the Swedish uh, COVID crisis, while the Danish politicians have said yeah, they have even criticized the, the, the medical experts uh, for uh, intervening in the process, political process. That's a part of the political culture. And there is not a knowledge on that the political culture and the administrative systems in Sweden going back to Oxelstierna and so on, that they are different. And it has to be described and analyzed, I think. The COVID is an example, but for example, even when the Ørsund Bridge was constructed, uh, there was a huge misunderstanding between the two countries and the public debates in the two countries. And it was that uh, when this, the so-called Vattendom stolen was uh, from the, 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 the environmental water mm -hmm. uh, court uh, was uh, not accepting the Ørsund project. It was in Denmark seen as the Swedish government was against the Ørsund bridge. And when the, the, the Vattendom stolen said yes to the project, no Danes was knowing that it means that it was uh, planned. Now the Danes were thinking it has to be planned. And that's how misunderstandings are beginning and developing and getting real consequences. So the bridge was almost a surprise in Denmark. Yeah. So I think there is a yes. need for anal analysis of some kind. Yes, I think in research on, on the so-called Nordic model, you hear often the saying that it's it's a Nordic model with five exceptions. So, on. so I think this uh, this thought of having like five exceptions to to and, and the kind of different national um, 
contexts that are, that are important to, to take into consideration. I think that's a good takeaway from our panel. I think if I if I'm correct, then my our time is up. Um, sorry that you I had to in, in, interrupt you. For am I correct? Um, thank you. I mean, yes. Uh, as we don't have any more uh, question, we can. Uh, start to uh, conclude and I thank you all panelists for uh, this fruitful uh, discussion and um, and of course without in this format we have no chance for applause but you definitely deserved such one but uh, so thank you from my part this was a very good and interesting discussion thanks to all the panelists and uh, for your good insights and, and thoughts on this topic and thanks again to the conference organizers Thank you, Sarah.